This is the Roller Coaster Podcast, and I'm your host, Lucy Q. Life is a wild ride. It has twists and turns. It's scary, exciting, and downright fun. So throw your head back, arms in the air, and come along with me for the ride. Life is like a roller coaster, baby. Most of us spend our lives following someone else's idea of success and happiness. We let other people's voices have a vote in what we do. We check boxes, chase gold stars, and lean in only to feel incomplete. When we don't define success in our terms, then finding our purpose and carving out our own path becomes impossible. So how do we break the cycle so that we can all live our best lives? That's exactly what today's guest, Laura Gassner Odding, helps people do. Laura has a new book out, Limitless, How to Ignore Everybody, Carve Your Own Path, and Live Your Best Life. It debuted as number two in the Washington Post bestseller list, right behind Michelle Obama. Hi, Laura. Hello. How are you doing today, Lucy? I'm great. It's so great to have you in this different format. Normally, we're talking on your weekly Zoom calls, and uh, we're in a large group of people. Now I hate you all to myself. I know. This is great. (laughs) This is great. So what a lot of people may not realize, unless they've gone back to episode 22, where I sat down with uh, my best friend, Lisa, and uh, we talked about being on or being a part of the Limitless course. And that was, joining the course was my first introduction to Limitless. And I believe Lisa met you or went to one of your seminars as part of one of her leadership and women programs out in, it probably would have been either Calgary or Edmonton. Uh, it was in Calgary. And in fact, if she was in my audience in Calgary, she saw the very first time that I ever did the talk from the book on a big stage. Wow. I was terrified. She's going to be excited to hear that. She's actually, I'm in Nova Scotia right now in my, our, our other house in Nova Scotia. And this is where I met Lisa. She's down the street and she's vacationing here too. So it's kind of neat. We're, we have to self-isolate for a little while because we entered into a new zone. So we have to, we have to behave. But uh, yeah, it's interesting that we're both here today and I get to chat with you one-on-one. It's fantastic. So how did the book Limitless come about? Like, What was the, the trigger point to start it? So it's actually kind of an interesting question, and it's a, it, it's a long story that I will make short, but I, I think it's important given that this is the roller coaster podcast to talk a little bit about the roller coaster that was the creation of the book. So when I sold the last company that I founded and built and ran to the women who helped me build it after running it for 15 years, I didn't quite know what I wanted to do. I sort of had an idea, but I wasn't entirely sure. And I um, did a lot of uh, informational interviewing. I was just trying to figure out what was next. And in the process of it, I said, yes, to a lot of things I shouldn't have said yes to. You know, like everyone's like, Laura's free now. Let's ask her to be the chair of this charity auction, you know, things like that, which I did. And I was getting introduced uh, on stage about four months into the, the, you know, post-sale moment where I had like five years of income sort of lined up from the sale. So I had plenty of runway to think about it, but this was about four or five months into that and she introduces me on stage and just in front of a crowd of, you know, several hundred people. And she's like, this is my dear friend, Laura, who dedicates her life to philanthropy. And I thought, uh, true, but incomplete. And in that moment, I wasn't sure if I wanted to stick the cocktail fork I was holding into my eyes or hers. But I was like, I just like dedicates her life to philanthropy is important, but not the whole of who I am. And I had this crisis of identity in that moment of like, who am I when I'm no longer LGO CEO? Here's my business card. So I started, I went home that night and I bought floragastnerodding.com and heylgo.com and I just started blogging. And then a friend of mine who was the executive producer of one of the local TEDx programs, which happens to be one of the two largest programs outside of like Big Ted itself, calls me up and she's like, hey, I saw that you did this uh, blog post 
And I think it would make a great TED talk. You should do one for us. And I said, no fucking way. <laughs> because, you know, that's terrifying. I've never spoken in front of people for, I didn't want to start. But my then 15 year old sitting in the car next to me and he was like, hey mom, don't you always tell me I have to do hard things? And don't you tell me if it doesn't challenge me, it doesn't change me. And don't you tell me that life starts on the other side of the fear. And I was like, shit, that's what you choose to listen to. You can't pick up your socks, but you listen to that. So fast forward six weeks later and I'm on the stage, no notes, no net, big red circle and me and 2,600 of my closest friends at a theater where they normally do the nutcracker, right? It was like big time, real deal, like gold gilded walls and you know crystal chandeliers. And it was terrifying. But then that talk got some attention. And then I got offered to be flown out to Idaho. So I live in Boston. So like all the way across the country, fly me out, fly me out to Idaho. And um, they were going to pay me $1,500 and room and board. And I was like, okay, I've never been to Idaho. Sure. So I go there. I give this talk. They pay me $1,500. They give me a hat with a potato on it. And they send me home. And I was like, wait a minute. This is interesting. There's a job where I stand on stage, I talk about things that are deeply meaningful to me, you pay me money, and then there's nothing else for me to do? Tell me more about this job. So those talks started getting attention. I got asked to give more and more talks. And then once I got to the stage where I was getting paid more than I ever thought was possible to do this sort of work, I noticed that everyone else on the stage at that level all had books. So I was like, yeah, I gotta get me one of them, right? So I call up a publisher that I knew, and I said, I'd like to write this book on confidence and finding your voice and all of that. And he said, great, we would love for you to do that. But before you do that, would you write this book uh, that we're doing as part of a career series, uh, non-obvious guide to like purpose doing work that matters? And I was like, ah, okay. So I start writing that. We're six weeks into the process. I'm fighting with the editor every day because a, 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 the kind of manual, the how-to book is like chapter one, problem, solution, chapter two, problem, solution, chapter three, problem, solution, chapter four, fall asleep. And it just didn't fit with, as you know now, as my like big energy about big things. Like it just didn't fit into that. So I called him up and I said, Rohit, I think you should fire me. I'm not the writer for you. This isn't the book for me. And he said, yeah, I agree. <laughs> and I said, wait, what? And he's like, yeah, I, I agree. This isn't the book for you, but I think there's a book, bigger book in here and we should publish that book in the spring in hardback when big idea books come out. And I said, wait, what? And that book became Limitless, How to Ignore Everybody, Carve Your Own Path, and Live Your Best Life. How's that for a roller coaster wow. story yeah. for the roller but coaster podcast? But that's always the way it, it goes, is that we're not necessarily looking for, or we try to have the answers to our problems right away, instead of just letting go and going with the journey and just seeing how things unfold. Yeah. I mean, I, the, problem that, the problem that I thought was the problem was that I needed to write a book. And it turns out that the problem was that I needed to have a thing that I cared about, that I talked about, that was actually a fancy business card for the message that I wanted to have on stage. And I was trying to rush to solve the immediate problem, with, which is like, insert book here, I need a book. I need to be a published author when I get introduced on stage and what I, what, what, because I spent some time wallowing and messing up and starting and restarting, I ended up solving the real problem, which was that I needed to be, she's the one who comes and talks about X, Y, Z, as opposed to like, here's somebody, she talks about stuff. Oh, she also has a book and none of it had any cohesion at all. And you brought up an interesting point when you, you mentioned that your, your friend had put this label on you and how, you know, it was somewhat defining who you were at the time and you were resisting that is something that I found a lot is that we succumb to the labels that other people are giving us. And those labels from what I found are some of our biggest limitations. That's absolutely true. I mean, I think, um, as you know, in the course, um, I, I tell a lot of stories about, the labels that I was given, right? So like I had a teacher in third grade who said, you're a really argumentative young woman, you should be a lawyer. So I just assumed that A, I should be a lawyer and B, the way that lawyers operate is that they argue all the time. Well, it turns out that I'm really confrontation averse. I don't want to spend my career arguing, but yet I was like, oh, if that's what she sees, and I know because it's 1980. 
too. I watch LA Law or whatever it is. And like, they seem really fancy. So I was like, okay, lawyers are clearly aspirational careers. This woman thinks that I should be a lawyer. That must be a compliment. I don't want to let her down. So I start leaning into that life, which puts me on a path to something that I don't even want to do in the first place. But it's because I was given this label, right? Like, let alone, like, let's not even get into like argumentative as a woman, bossy, good manager, good leader, all the rest of what like the good side of those things are. But what I got was you're argumentative. You should tamp down that side of yourself. And also this is what success is a lawyer. So I had to figure out how to do that. And then I got to law school and I realized I didn't want to be a lawyer at all. And I didn't want to practice law. And even though I had at that point learned that there are lots of other ways to practice law other than just fighting with people in a courtroom, it still wasn't what I wanted. And when I found that volunteering for a presidential campaign for somebody who inspired the hell out of me, I still felt like I was letting the entire world down by dropping out of law school. So like, I keep finding it, it. It's, I don't know if it's just because I'm very in tune with it or because it is becoming such a relevant topic, but it seems that everything seems to be, especially after the lockdown, everything seems to be evolving and revolving around purpose. So is there a reason to why, why is this an issue now? Why now? Why today? So I think it's actually been coming for a little while, you know, like I think, so I live in the United States and especially in the United States, you know, we had an election in 2016, which forced everyone to make a decision about where they stood, right? I mean, it was a pretty divisive election. Um, and I think then you saw like in the 2018 Super Bowl, for example, every, like the 2017 uh, or 2016 uh, ads were all like Paris Hilton leaning on, a, on, the, on the hood of a car eating a sloppy burger, right? And it was, it was like sex and it was, you know, comedy and it was, you know, like the raunchiest commercials ever. And then you get 2017, 2018, 2019, and suddenly every commercial is like falling all over themselves to show interracial families and same-sex couples couples and caring about the environment and investing in women and children. And it's like everybody was working really hard to show their purpose because I think people had this 2016 moment where they said, I need to figure out what I stand for. And not only do I need to figure that out, I need to vote with my wallet as well. I need to actually spend money. So if Home Depot, for example, is giving donations to Trump's campaign and Lowe's is giving money to Trump's uh, opponent, you can make a decision where you buy your hammers. And I think people started seeing more of that in commercials. It started becoming more obvious to them that there actually were ramifications of choices that they made. And so I think that's now trickling down to this, this work. So, you know, all of us in lockdown started saying things like the new normal, right? I guess this is just the new normal. And you've heard me talk about this in the course that I reject the idea of the new normal because I always rejected the idea of the old normal. So for me, I keep asking people, when life goes back to normal, is the life that you're going to go back to really the normal that you want? And I think our companies are, you know, any people in management positions or people that are thinking about leading teams have to be asking themselves, if the team who left in March isn't the team who's returning now, what's changed about them? How have they changed? How have we changed what does success really mean for us individually, for us as a company? And do our culture, our systems, our people, our metrics, our tech, our quality assurance, do those things match what we say? So we're a company that says we care about deep, undistracted work, and yet you get 88 emails per hour and you're expected to answer those within you know, an hour period you're not in consonance with who you really are. And so I think because we've had this moment that I think we were leading up to it and, and, and COVID, I think, shone a real light on it in the same way that you saw it shine light on the Black Lives Matter movement. Like this has all been brewing for a long time. And then all of a sudden it's like spark match and everyone's paying attention. Yeah. And it's, you know, I never thought of it in, in the aspect of it, it stemmed from, that election and the results of that election. I guess, you know, I'm in Canada. So we see what's happening in the US, but we're also really removed. So, I mean, I, and, I, and I guess obviously, I'm, people still watch TV, so they're still gonna see, especially when it comes to the Super Bowls, they're gonna see the commercials. So they're gonna, 
they're going to be influenced by that. But I'd never really thought about it in that, in that context that that was the, you know, the, the catalyst for all of this coming about. I mean, it's certainly, I think it's been coming about for a while. And it's, it's, I think in the United States, that was very much a, a sort of cataclysmic moment. But I think, you know, I mean, even, even, you know, in Canada, when Trudeau was asked why 50% of his cabinet were women of people of color, he was like, uh, what did he say? It was like 2014 or like whatever year that was. He was like, it was like, a, he was like, had like a dumbfounded response, like, duh. Because it's did. a modern, like it's a modern era. So I think it's been coming everywhere. Like it's happening, you know. And Macron did it in France, and I forget the the prime minister in Spain's name. But each one of them also started looking at diversity in their cabinets. And I think just ha- being able to have a conversation about diversity and that people bring different things to the table and and how we all see each other differently. I think purpose really goes hand in hand with those conversations where we're we are realizing that it's you know more than just us on this planet. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely a different way to look at it. Um, okay, so let's go into the book Limitless itself and what it's actually all about. Did you want to elaborate on that a little bit about your, basically your four C's? Sure, yeah. So in 20 years, so, so, so I spent 20 years doing executive search. And as a retained executive recruiter, it was my job to go out and find the best in class, the bold-faced names, the people who are written about, you know, in the newspapers, the ones that are the leaders, quote unquote, leaders. And my job was to be hired by a client to figure out what kind of leadership they needed and to go out and find that person. And the people that we were finding are not necessarily people that were applying for jobs, right? They're not necessarily people who were coming to us. They were the ones who were super successful in what they were doing, which is why they were, you know, nationally or world renowned. So I spent 20 years calling people who were super successful in the work that they were doing. And I spent 20 years having those people pick up the phone or call me back. And I was fascinated by the idea that even though they were so super successful on paper, clearly there was something missing because if there wasn't, they wouldn't be calling me back, right? So I was fascinated by the idea that success didn't always equal happiness. So I started to look at the thousands of people that I interviewed and the handful of those who had both success and happiness as well as very specific decisions I made in my own life. The first was dropping out of law school and joining that uh, presidential campaign. The second was leaving the White House and going to become a, a headhunter. The third was having that moment of rage and starting my own company. The fourth was you know, deciding to sell it. The fifth you know, was the, the speaking. You know? So at each one of those moments, I also had a decision to make. And what I found throughout my career and throughout the careers of the several dozen of these thousands who had both success and happiness was that what they had and what I had in each time I was able to make the right change was what I call in the book consonance. And consonance is alignment. It's flow. It's harmony. It's when, it's when the best of what you do it's a, it, it matches the, you know, it's, a, it's when who you are matches what you do. So Lucy, like, you know, those moments, and we talk about this a bit in the course, like when you are at your very best, like you feel like you're firing on all cylinders, you're making it rain, you're like closing the deal, or maybe you're helping a friend in like a quiet moment, but you are really like, you are at your very, very best. Yeah. And you have those moments when you're at your best, the best of what you do is being called upon for a problem you actually care about. One that really matters to you and is meaningful, and you are being rewarded for solving that problem in a way that actually resonates with you. It might be money, it might be flexibility, it might be fame and fortune, it might be adoration, whatever the thing is. And each one of us at every age and at every life stage wants different things in order to have this moment, this feeling of consonance. In the book, I talk about them as being four things, calling, connection, contribution, and control. So I'll give you one sentence on, on, on each of those four. Calling is that gravitational force that, that, that drives you to get up in the morning, to do the work you do. It is the cause you want to solve, the company you want to build, the bottom line you want to grow, the family you want to nurture. It is that thing that at this moment in time you care about more than anything else. Connection answers the question, is the work that I'm doing actually connecting to that calling and helping me get further towards making that a reality? Contribution, if connection's about the work, contribution is really about you. How does this job, this paycheck, this family, this work defined as 
paid work or volunteer work, wherever you spend most of your, your time, how does this work allow me to manifest my values on a daily basis, have the trajectory of a career or a family life that I want, um, earn enough money to have the lifestyle that I, that, that I desire or the life that I need? And then the last one is control. And control basically just says, how much personal agency do you have in order to ensure that your work is connecting to that calling? And it's contributing uh, contributing to your life in the way that you really need it to. So, in, in sort of what's playing in my mind is, is this something that you can achieve in the early years of your life, or is it something that comes more when you've developed that wisdom of life and that life experience? Because when I think of who I was in my twenties, I'm nowhere close to the same person. I don't even think I stopped to ask myself or even knew I could really ask myself these questions. So, you know, now like when we're seeing this, this is this trend that's going on. And I know we have two, um, they're not kids anymore. They're, they're adults. They're 18 and, and 21. And we've always tried to guide them into pursuing what they love and not to necessarily think, think of, a job as like a nine to five, this is, you do one thing, but more look at revenue streams, doing the things that you love and, and, and build your life more sort of looking through the lenses of an entrepreneur. I mean, there's a lot of people out there that want to have those nine to five jobs and, and, and do those things. Um, but, I, but I question, is it something that can really be achieved in your early, I call it early years, you know, your, your twenties versus your forties. So your definition of consonants right now would not have been achievable in your 20s. It also wouldn't be the one you wanted in your 20s. So let's go back to that time when I dropped out of law school and joined the presidential campaign. I had all the calling in the world. I was a billion percent inspired by this presidential candidate. It was amazing, right? Like this was, it was, I felt like I was, I was, I was, I was, following this gravitational force, right? This charismatic presidential candidate. So all the calling in the world. Connection? I mean, I got the coffee for the guy who got the coffee for the guy who got the coffee. Like there, my work was not connected whatsoever. It didn't matter. If I showed up late, if I called in sick, nobody would notice yet another, you know, campaign volunteer wasn't there. No connection whatsoever. Contribution. Uh, was this job paying me so that I could have the lifestyle that I wanted? No, I was worth my weight in ramen soup. However, I was manifesting my values on a daily basis. And I, if he won, I could have pretty maybe interesting career path if I was able to wrangle my way, you know, into a job in the White House. So tons of contribution. And then control. I didn't know from one day to the next that they were going to send me to, you know, to, to, to Poughkeepsie or Little Rock or, you know, LA. Like I, I, I had no control at all. I was a total peon, but I didn't need it. So you don't need all of connection, all of control, all of contribution, all of calling. At every age and at every life stage, you're going to want to need different amounts. So at that time, you know, I was single. I was 21 years old. I didn't care that, you know, I, I, I wasn't able to go out to fancy restaurants and fly first class and do all sorts of things. I was, I was willing to sleep on high school gymnasium floors. Now I'm, you know, rounding 50 and I mean, the Holiday Inn is camping. Like, I don't like, I'm a princess. Let me just be really clear. So, you know, could I speak in the pre-COVID days? Could I have accepted a quarter of what I earned to speak on stage and spoken four times a week, every week, all year round? Yes. Would I make more money, probably on balance, yes, but would my life be hell? A hundred percent. So my, that would be like what the old version of my 21-year-old consonants looked like, was, would be doing that. My version right now is my calling is I'm actually not trying to get an individual elected or solve a certain problem. My calling right now is to build my platform as large as I possibly can, because I know that if my platform is huge, then I can influence more people towards good overall, right? So my calling is still like get the right people in the right place, but it's shifted in how I, how I, how I work it right now. In terms of connection, I am so busy that if the work I'm doing does not actually matter, it's actually taking away from my ability to work. So I need to have a ton of connection. 
in terms of contribution, I'm not going to say I'm Linda Evangelista and I won't get out of bed for less than $25,000 a day, you know, like the 1980 <laughs> supermodel, but I, I, it's got to matter. It's got to contribute. It's got to make sense. And then in terms of control, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm an entrepreneur through and through. So I have to have control, but I'm actually, I would be willing to give up a little bit of control in order to um, make sure that I'm able to speak to the kinds of clients that I want to be able to influence the kinds of people that I want. So my, my rubric has changed as I've changed and grown. And I think what happens is that we wake up one day and we say, I don't feel like I have a purpose. I don't have a calling. And then we think that we're just stuck. But the truth is that at every age and at every life stage, our purpose and our calling is going to change. And our need to have the rest of these pieces will change as well. My kids are going to be out of, the, out of the house. Mine are 16 and 18. They'll be out of the house in a few years. And my rubric will probably change completely again because it, that's what happens through all these natural on-ramps and off-ramps that we have in life. So that's a long answer to the question. The short answer is, yeah, a 20-year-old can absolutely find consonants. It's just not going to look like their 50-year-old parents. So, yeah, and so I guess what you're, you're also saying that your, your four C's are going to change depending on the time of life, the season of your life. They're always going to be, you know, some are going to have more value or more priority than others, but you always want to be aware of what those are and how they fit into your life. Right. So I created this limitless assessment, which you took as part of the course. And for those I who did. aren't in the course, <laughs> yeah, they're, so they're at, it's at limitlessassessment.com. And it's kind of intense. It takes like 20 minutes, as you know. It's got a lot yeah. of questions, um, which, you know, probably not the smartest thing to do as you're building a business is to send somebody a 67 question quiz. However, I stand by it because you have one big juicy life you should spend 20 minutes getting it right. <laughs> I think that's okay. But if you take the quiz now, and if you, Lucy, went back and you took the quiz as like yourself from 15 years ago, you probably would have answered the questions very differently about how much of each of the things you had and how much of each of the things you want. And as you're planning for the future, you might say, well, I think I would like my life to look like X going forward and then actually see if that puts you in line. But I, I when I was developing the quiz, I actually took the quiz as myself when I was in my early 20s, when I was in my early 30s, in my early 40s, just to see how, like I tried to, I, I looked at my resume and I was like, what job was I in? What position was I in? What company was it? Who was my boss? And I thought about how I felt in those moments. And I had a very different answer. And that's why the results of the assessment don't just say you need more calling or you need more connection. They'll say, here's how much of calling, connection, contribution, and control you have in your life. And then there's an overlay of how much you actually want. And then it gives you some very specific steps that you could take so that you can um, figure out a way to get more of it. But I think the important thing to know is that you don't have to have 100% of all four of the C's of consonants. You have to have a little bit of each, but everybody's going to want and need different amounts at different times. And what you want and need as an individual and what you want and need as a spouse or a mother or as a friend also might be different. Yeah, and it just you know, again, it's just so fits into the patterns of your life and where your life is at that stage. And, you know, obviously if anybody takes the course, I'm going to put the, um, the link for that assessment in the show notes so that anybody can go and, and take these quizzes. Um, because ultimately the book is great and, you know, I've read the book, but it's not until you really go into the course and you start being asked these hard questions and looking at things that you're really, you know, some, some areas you can breeze through and you're like, Oh yeah, I got this. I got this. And then you get to some, and some places and you're like, shit. <laughs> well, I mentioned this in the limitless live that we had just this past Friday that you can thank your fellow Canadian Leanne Davey for that because <laughs> I sent her the original workbook and she was like, Laura, you ask me the hardest questions of anybody and you're not asking hard enough questions in these exercises. You need to push people. You need to make it harder. You need to make it uncomfortable. So yeah, <laughs> you, can, that, you can thank your fellow Canadian yeah, for that one. And it was on our call the other day that somebody had said that they were, they had gotten stuff yeah, or they couldn't, couldn't move forward at, at the exercise to do with your calendar when you're actually looking at how much time you're, you're spending doing you know, your, your four C's and, you know, are you doing what matters? 
And you know, you you had a really good answer. Is yeah, you're probably not. And you know, <laughs> and, mean, and move forward. You know, obviously, you're you're not going to be asking these questions and taking this course if you are completely limit limitless in everything that you're doing. Um, so where are you know what have you found some of the places that people are getting stuck in the in the course or in questions with the book where they're not sure how to move forward? I think the most important um, point of the book is 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 you know so the book's called Limitless: How to Ignore Everybody, Carve Your Own Path, and Live Your Best Life. And I think the ignore everybody is the most important part and also the part where people get stuck because, you know, they're like, I really want to ignore everybody, but I don't want them not to like me when I do. And so I have a, um, I've been doing a, a, a webinar series as like a lead in almost like a, um, almost like a, uh, like a prequel to the book that leads into selling the course. And it's called, you know, the three lies you're telling yourself. Right. So one of the three lies is, people aren't going to like the real me. And what I say to that is, yeah, that one, because, you know, some of the excuses we make are real and some of them are perceived. And what I say to that one is actually that one's real. There will be people who won't like the real you. The lie that you're telling yourself is that those people matter. Yeah. Right. That's what we tell ourselves. So when I dropped out of law school, my parents were horrified Fast forward a few years and I'm giving them a tour of the Oval Office in the White House. They're not so horrified anymore. Um, I leave the White House early to go, you know, start this career in executive search. And my colleagues who fought and clawed their way to get there were shocked. They later became my clients. Then I left the big firm to start my own. And my, my you know, the, the other people that worked in the firm that thought I was ruining my career ended up becoming my staff. And at every stage, like people will look at you and they'll be so worried and so horrified. And then we worry about what they think when in fact they really shouldn't matter to us. I say, you know, we shouldn't give votes in our lives to people who shouldn't even have voices, but we, we see, it happens in numbers like we see friends at the coffee shop and they're like, oh my God, you can't do that. That's so scary. And what they mean is, oh my God, I can't do that. That would be too scary for me. But we hear them and we don't want to disappoint them and we don't want them to be right. And we're really worried. And so we let that happen. Then we have people that are jealous so the ones that are sizing up their own self-worth by whether they are above you, and once you grow past the stage where they preferred you, smaller, they get jealous and maybe they don't like you. And then we have the ones that just, it's just out of a place of love. Like the last time I lived in the same house as my parents, I was 18 years old. And, you know, I... I I wasn't the same person as I am now, right? I left my socks on the floor and I would put the cartons of milk back. Oh, you guys, you guys have bags of milk back in the refrigerator, you know, mostly empty. And, and they don't know how I've grown and how I've changed. They don't know the heartbreak and the sadness and the failure that shaped me. They don't know the triumph and the, and the, and the success that has given me momentum. They just don't see me every single day. So even though they love me, their opinions still hold me back. So whether those opinions are coming out of fear or jealousy or love, it's this idea that we're giving votes to all these other people and then we're worrying what they think about us when really we should be asking ourselves, whose opinion do I really want? Whose opinion makes me better? Whose opinion makes me stronger and, and, and fitter and faster and more empathetic and more loving? And you know, we talk about that in the course where you figure out who the hinges are that really matter. And then whose opinion, whose approval do you really seek? So the only people you shouldn't be ignoring in this world are the ones whose opinions make you a better version of yourself and whose approval actually really truly does matter. And, you know, the, the, the thing that was running in my head was being liked and you brought up family. And I think that's probably one of the, I mean, depending on your family dynamics, your family you know, as an adult, when I sit, when, you know, I'm referring to the family, you know, my parents and my siblings, they were probably the ones when I started doing the things that mattered to me, that really lit me up. I was most afraid of their opinions. When, you know, when I look back, they probably never really knew who the true person was anyways. 
They certainly don't know who I am today. Sure, they see the, you know, the daughter, the sister that shows up to family events and you have your conversation, there's gaggles of kids running around. But they don't know me. So yes, I love and respect what they have to say, but I can't let their opinions, their own fears, limit me in any way because then you end back, you end back up in that place where you're not happy, where you know something's wrong. And, you know, so dealing with that part of the family was an issue for me for a while, but now it's just, fuck it. Like, like really, like, what, what am I worried about? What am I worried about? Listen, I am a 49 year old grown ass woman who makes her career getting on stage and national television and radio telling people to ignore everybody and live their own damn life. And every single time I see my mother, she still comments about the hue of my blonde highlights and the size of my big ass. (laughs) And I will tell you, it still hurts because at the end of the day, she's still my mom, you know? And even though there is not a, an ounce of concern that I have that my blonde isn't right or my ass isn't going to be whatever the size it's going to be. Thank you, menopause. It still, it's still, you know, it's, it, you still have a reaction to it. And I, 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 you know, I love my mother. I, she is a, a role model and a hero to me in so many ways and also a stranger to me in a lot of ways. You know, I mean, I, I, we know each other very well and we'll never really know each other very well because that's just how that generation was. You know, they're just less open. They were less, like I, I remember growing up, I never saw my parents fight. I never saw my parents sick. I never saw them unsure. They like, they like went behind the scenes, made everything happen, and they like presented the world. It, they, it was like my parents were a unit, and then there we were. And I, we raise our family very differently, where we have family meeting, and we talk about things, and we're very open. Because, you know, I think my mother grew up at a time where the first wave of feminists had to be perfect. They had to be macho. They had to be strong. They had to be, you know, so buttoned up and so, like, emotionally hardened that that's that transferred over into the house and my generation now and the generation coming after that sees things so differently and so i think even though we have parents that love us and they want the best for us we're just we are being raised as different people at different times and that's even even if you did live in the same place like my i live a thousand miles away from my parents so it's even further and then you add on to it you know the way they raise me is differently than how i raise my kids and you know there's just everybody has an opinion and you don't always need to you don't you don't need to go to every party you're invited to you know you don't need to listen to everybody this morning i did a whole post about how um i did my regular facebook live and i did a whole post about how i bought a joint this weekend at our local recreational dispensary I haven't smoked a joint in 25 years. I probably won't smoke another one for 25 years. But I did a whole thing about how I learned how to buy a joint this weekend. If you would have told 1988 me that I was going to stand in line at a public place and hand my ID to a security guard so that I could pay with a credit card to buy a pre-rolled joint, I would have laughed you out of the room. And yet nothing has made me want to smoke a joint more than 2020. So I put it on. And I literally, right before we got on this recording, I got a text from my mother saying, I watched your pot video. You might want to take it down. It might upset some people. (laughs) Not the Canadians. (laughs) And and, and so, you know, and I sat there for a little while and I was like, she's probably right. And also I thought about that before I posted it. Thank you very much. And so maybe it will, maybe it'll upset some people. Those just aren't my people. Exactly. And that's okay. And that's it. Yeah, it is. Um, Now, one of the things in your book is that you have some really great stories that outline people that from, and and we do this, we look at people from the outside and we have all these assumptions. You know, that person is popular, they're pretty, they're, you know, they have great jobs, they're great leaders, they're doing this, they're doing that. But as you mentioned, 
they're missing that piece of them. Something's not, not right. I think, mm -hmm. I think you use the term, um, you got your feet in two different speedboats and they're going different directions. Yes. <laughs> what is, before we, before we get wrapped up, I, you know, is there a, you know, a particular story that you think might resonate with our listeners um, to how somebody sort of identified how they didn't have that in their life and then, you know, how they went through the, the process? Uh, well, I, um, the story that you mentioned about the foot in two different speedboats is actually Josh Mance, who was uh, an army captain. He was actually shot and killed by a sniper in Iraq. And I interviewed him years later. So if your listeners are like, wait, what? <laughs> Maybe they went to the recreational pot shop. No, no, no. <laughs> he was dead for 15 full minutes and then he was brought back to life. He flatlined for 15 minutes. And um, so I called him up and I was like, all right, everybody reading this book is going to say like, well, yeah, but she had access to this and he was able to do this and they were able, you know, they had, you know, some background in this, that, and the other, and everyone can make excuses, but you died. And then figured out what life was all about. So, you know, I feel like that's like an unimpeachable, like that's like, that's not just a good story to start with. And Josh, it's interesting because he, he only ever wanted to be in the military. And when he was shot and killed and had to leave, uh, had to leave service, he ended up going to go work for Tesla because he was like, it's the fastest growing company in the world. Like the founder's uh, vision is, 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 uh, you know, is, is unstoppable. World domination is the plan. Like the face felt, pace felt like combat. It was very familiar to him. And what he kept, uh, he kept getting these calls to go speak places about the truth behind trauma. Like what happens to soldiers when they come back from war? And he was finding that he loved the work he was doing for Tesla. It felt so important. And he also loved the work he was doing, giving talks all over the country about PTSD and trauma and life after death and his whole journey back to you know, learning how to walk again and everything. And he found that both of those things were really important and he had an allurement, but he didn't have alignment. And he had to really go to ground and figure out what he actually cared about. Like if he had one day left on this planet, which of these things would he choose to do, right? He, he started doing what, what we start uh, in, in the course by doing uh, an inventory of your attention. Where do you spend your time? What do you like to do? If, you're, if you have the option to do anything you want to do, how would you spend that time? And then how much of your day are you actually spending doing it? And then the course really, sort of, and the book walk people through how to figure out what your calling might be, how to figure out how much connection you need, how to figure out what form you want the contribution of your work to take, and then how do you go about getting more control if you need it or want it in any of these things. And throughout the book, there are lots of stories that go everything, everywhere from the guy who died and came back to life to the woman who you know realized that turning around on Everest, getting back down alive was actually the definition of success, not getting to the top necessarily. There's a story of somebody who got divorced and got remarried because he realized that the unhappiness wasn't in the work, it was actually at home. So there really are stories for everybody throughout the book. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Laura. Um, I will have all of the, the links to your social media, your website, your course, and definitely where to buy the book because I think it's important that everybody takes a chance to read it. And uh, we'll get more people in the class on Fridays. That would be fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Lucy. Well, I hope you have a great you. afternoon. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Roller Coaster Podcast. Want to chat or share your ideas about today's show? Pop me an email at hello at the rollercoasterpodcast.com. Don't forget to connect with me on Facebook and Instagram at The Roller Coaster Podcast. Our theme song, Roller Coaster, was performed by The Lucky Setback. Audio editing by the one and only Jeff Quigley of Quigley Creative. Life is like a roller coaster, baby, baby. I wanna ride, 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 ride. Life is like a roller coaster, baby.